my all time favorite presidential candidate, Doug Burgum, went on uh, went on breaking points with Crystal and Sager. And man, did he collapse under basic minimum pressure just on policy questions, like basic policy questions. He like turned into a pile of dust right in front of everybody. OK, so here you can see he literally looks like a mannequin or an embalmed corpse. See, look at him. Look at him right here. It's amazing. I'm not, he might, his existence might have just swayed me into believing lizard people exist. I'm just saying, I'm just saying. Okay, so this gets fun. Buckle up, everybody. My sense from, you know, watching you speak, reading your website is you're kind of a traditional economic conservative. So let me ask you on a number of issues, and Sagar and I can go back and forth here. So on the social security program, do you think it should be cut? Do you think it should be left alone or do you think it should be increased? North Dakota this year, we were able to successfully, after 30 years of debate, close the defined benefit pension plan for state employees and at the same time protect every employee that's in it. In other words, I'm going to dodge that one. I'm, I'm not going to give you a direct answer, homie. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to I'm gonna have to side stepping to do a little two step in this bitch. Like, okay. All right. All right, Doug. We see you. And there's going to be entire disease classes that get eliminated in the next 10 or 15 years. I think every actuarial table in America is off. So and just cut. Keep it the way it is or increase. And in terms of cuts, I, what I'm reading into what you're saying is for people who are in it, they're going to be fine. Age. But what about younger yeah. Americans? Well, what would you say to them? Well, your, your, your question suggests that those are only the three choices. Those are the only three choices. That's it. Cut, increase, or stay the same. And even if you say, well, I want to like privatize it, I want to reform it. At the end of the day, there will still be either a net increase, cut, or it'll stay the same even if you totally change the nature of the program. So she's saying that because those are the only options available. Okay, all right, this is gonna be fun. He's gonna, he turns into Neo from the Matrix dog. He, <laughs> We've made a commitment, you're in social security, we have to protect that. Mm -hmm. But we also can't bankrupt America uh, at the same time, on the other side, you have to figure out a way to be smart about doing it. And part of that has got to be economic growth, because if we don't, if we don't have our economy, so young sprinkled. Americans could potentially see cuts. Right. So if if we paid in the system, I'm 31. Yeah, I guess I haven't paid in the system that long. I mean, my eye on the chopping block. Like, would under your uh, kind of analysis here, presumably, I would benefit from the genomic. Do you, medicine. you as a 31 year old, <laughs> yeah. as a 31 year old, do you, well, you're going to yeah. be living to be 100. But do you, well, hopefully, but yeah. yeah. I mean, I you all, you all, all, right? all, yeah. all you youngsters are going to live that long. But I mean, do you expect that yeah. you're you're going to see a paycheck? I don't know. I mean, are, well, are you, are I, you I depending on it? Since the government has made that commitment, the government should fulfill that commitment. I also, know, payroll taxes. I also know yeah. what Social Security has meant for right. old age poverty. On that point, I believe the number was about 35% of seniors lived in poverty prior to Social Security. And then after Social Security, it dropped to below 10%. One of the most phenomenally successful government programs in the history of the United States of America, and it's beloved by the public. So all these people, he, look, Burgum knows it's a political third rail, and so he's not telling you the truth, which is, yeah, I want to cut it. I'm an economic conservative. I want to get rid of it or I want to cut it. He won't just say it. I would respect him more if he just said it. Just say your position and stand by it. Stand on it. Instead, he's like, well, well I don't know. Well, geno genomic medicine and stuff and things. And okay, man. Okay. So the American people are certainly on the side of let's figure out how to keep benefits the way they are. Yes. And if you've got both parties agreeing that you can't touch it mm. and it's financially and actuarially completely unsound. Well, you can always lift the cap. And that would very much change yeah, we can the change revenue. revenue so you guys, you guys are saying Let me just lay out what Crystal's talking about there. The way it works right now is I'm going to get the numbers a little bit wrong, but this is in the ballpark. Basically, on your first $140,000 in income per year, that is taxed at, at one rate. The Social Security tax is one rate. I don't know exactly what the number is. But everything above that $140,000 line is not taxed at all. So not only do we not, we don't even have... We don't have a progressive tax rate for Social Security. We don't even have a flat tax rate for Social Security. It's like only everybody's first $140,000 a year is taxed at all for Social Security. So if somebody makes like $20 million a year, only their first $140,000 is taxed for Social Security. If you lift that cap and just tax whatever the percentage is on people's entire income, then the program is fully solvent as far as the eye can see. But that would include that would mean raising taxes on the wealthy. And these guys hate that. By the way, Doug Burgum is maybe a billionaire.
You guys are saying we have something that's financially uh, we're in a crisis. We're, oh, we're trying uh, to no, get but, you nailed down on what you yeah, think. But you're saying that you sh we shouldn't fix things that are broken. Is that what you're saying? Well, no. I, think, I think what we're advocating or what we're trying to advocate for is a vast majority of even Republican seniors, you know, hands off my Medicare was a huge part of the Tea Party yeah. movement back in 2010. Same with Social Security. A lot of these seniors and even people who are 40s, 50s coming into the system feel as if that their future is uncertain. So, I mean, at that very basic level, like speak to them, to those people right. who are like, hey, I'm afraid. Are you going to take my money away? Like I barely am able to make my mortgage right now with inflation, with freaking home insurance and all this stuff. I've got a fixed income. You know, I think, what is it, 50 something percent of these seniors relying entirely on Social Security. Just speak to the concern that those people have right now. And, well, and also the people like us who are like looking at the system and saying, hey, maybe, you know, well, so let's say you haven't done so well in life. Like that's at least one thing that you can rely on whenever you get old. And I think that's why we yeah. say we, at all costs, you have to protect that system for those mm -hmm. people. The ones okay. that you're talking about has to be protected. Uh, Social Security, Med Medicaid, we've got to protect that. But the, uh, if we have that there, we still have to, as a country, we have to say, okay, we're protecting that. Mm -hmm. But does that preclude us from actually having a discussion uh, across the country of saying, how do we do things that actually are financially viable for, for future generations? I'm just, I don't know what that means. So be a little more specific because that's, I feel like you're, you know, you're not giving us a direct answer. I'm giving on, you, I'm giving is you part of what you would be looking at for people who aren't in the program yet, reducing the benefits, or would you be looking more toward the side of, okay, how do we bring in more revenue? Because I'll tell you, I think a lot of people look at, you know, all the money that we're spending in the Ukraine war, and it's like, there's always money for the Pentagon, there's always money for the defense industry, there's always money for the Ukraine war, but there's a, this constant fixation on how do we peel back the, the pennies that are given to ordinary Americans. Well, you know, we're spending $2 trillion on complete folly around uh, you know, forcing an ideology around an energy policy, mm. you know, where we're going to we're going to say we're going to subsidize 500,000 EV charging stations. We're going to subsidize people buying expensive EV cars okay. and we're going to buy batteries from who? China. Is he talking about the Inflation Reduction Act? Like the one half decent piece of legislation that's been passed recently? He's like, yeah, this is the thing. We shouldn't be spending money on this, bro. Shouldn't be spending money on trying even a little bit to get off of fossil fuels. Shouldn't do that. China controls 85% of all the rare earth minerals in the world, and so we're just trading OPEC for science. Why are we talking about China? Why are we talking about China? They're asking you about social security. Give a direct answer. You're gonna yeah. use that money for social security? Well, it certainly would be a better use because again, in, you know, we figured out in this nation through markets, you know, how to, you know, how to provide transportation without saying, if you want to have 500,000 EV charging stations mm -hmm. and you can't get a permit to build a transmission line and at the same time, we're trying to shut down all the base load in this country, you need five times the transmission lines to run those things. So the policies that we're literally spending trillions on don't make any sense economically, okay, physics, any of that. We're still activity. not talking about Social Security, but what- Well, we are, but I mean, that would free up, that, <laughs> you're saying, where's the dollars? So you're saying some of those dollars would be- There's all kinds of dollars that would be freed okay. up to, to fix the thing that really matter to take care of, of, of so Americans. So no cuts to Social Security for young people. Okay. Is that yes? Well, you could say yes, no yeah. cuts. <laughs> Look at what happens when you, all you have to do is ask basic follow-up questions and they just, it, he just melts. He melts. He turns into a popsicle on a hot Florida summer day. Jesus Christ. This is basic stuff, man. You're oh. running for president. People want to know, you know, what do you think on this issue? What would you Presumably do? What would your approach be? I, I, I yeah, think I'm, on, I'm honest about the fact yeah. that the thing is not actuarially sound. Okay. And so, so if we have on the tape. So then say, cut it. Say it. Say the words, say it. Don't play hide the ball, don't be a weasel. Say it, own it, argue for it. Instead of this weird thing where like you're refusing to say it because you know it's not politically viable, but you wanna argue for it, but you're only semi-arguing for it because you know that if you say the thing, you'll go from 0% to like negative 7% in the polls. Say it, own it. No, we have to protect everybody that's in the program right now, but yeah. then how do you solve a problem when there's not enough okay. money to pay for it? You have to have growth. And part of the way you have growth is you have you get rid of the red tape. You have innovation, not regulation. You have an energy policy that allows our economy to sprint, not- What are you you're talking about energy policy? You're talking about innovation. You're talking about markets. The whole point of social security is that it's not that. It is a government program. This isn't subject to the whims of the marketplace. Are you saying privatize social security, which by the way, would be an effective cut and it would make it way more volatile. And then we stop doing things that are supporting China, like our energy policy. Last question, China. China. your team's telling us that you have to go. So you've uh, done <laughs> your, team, uh, your team's saying that you gotta go because you're uh, currently morphing into a gerbil on set live. And it's not, uh, it's not, it's not going well for you. We need to get you uh, back into the Lord and Taylor store because you look like a human mannequin. He's got to go. He's got to get out of there. God, you asked a follow-up question and he fumbled it. 
So he's got to go. Sorry. Do you think that you pay too high, too low, or just about the right in terms of taxes and for people who have also done very well? Well, in, in North Dakota, we're, mm. we're working to get, eliminate income taxes because uh, you want to have an incentive. Well, on the federal system. So you're running for president. So how do you think the federal tax regime treats you know your people of your net worth and higher? Uh, there's a lot of people who even Republicans really are concerned about that. I'm just curious. You know, We very rarely get to speak to somebody like you who's both a high net worth individual and a politician. So how do you look at the current tax regime federally, of which you would be in charge of? Well, I, one of the things that I love about the, one of the few places government does not provide competition. One of the few places it does provide competition is at the state level, where different states can have a state with less regulation and lower taxes. And guess what? It attracts talent and capital to come to those locations. Yet again, he's not answering. Yet again, hey, do you think taxes should be the same, higher, or lower for people in your tax bracket? And he's maybe a billionaire, maybe just shy of a billion dollars. And this is how he's answering the question. Oh my, innovation and uh, the states are the laboratories of democracy. And, you know, we try to be, in, bring in talent by lowering the, you know what I'm saying? It, it's a roundabout way of saying, I think they should be low, even for me. That It's a roundabout way of saying that, but he won't just say it because he won't own any of his positions because he knows he'll crumble if he has to argue and defend his position. We should be trying to attract all the talent in the world to come to America. This is the land of opportunity. We should be creating a place where capital and talent want to come to our country as opposed to we drive it away. And then everybody assumes, I mean, it's like, if you have a bad product and you're in business, you have a bad product and say, hey, we're losing money. What should we do? Let's raise price on our product. Mm. Well, then you'd go out of business because so, people aren't paying your product. So you think anyway. we should have lower taxes so more rich people from other countries should move here? It's, it's not about rich people. It's or, about, okay, upper we, upper we, class, have, we have income. Engineers, yeah. I started yeah. out with I started out with basically nothing. Mm -hmm. I mean, part yeah. of income mobility up is part of the that's part of the American dream. And this idea that there's a static class, you know, that somehow it's not paying their share. I mean, you know, that is increasingly the case, though. I mean, if you look at the tax rate, not paying the very 128,000 people in California, 128,000 very wealthy pay as opposed to your average middle class person, the very wealthy as a percentage of their income pay far less. Yeah, so and just, it's a percentage of their you, income. One percent of Californians pay fifty percent okay. of their taxes so in a high tax rate. They also make all of the goddamn money. They pay a disproportionate amount of tax, bro. But they also make all the goddamn money. The bottom fifty percent in this country have like what two percent of the wealth, if that. God, oh my god, ah, 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 is also disingenuous. Oh my god. Do you think that at the federal level? Do you think at the do you think at the federal level? that the tax regime is uh, too hard on the rich should it be lowered further so we can attract whoever it is you want to attract to the country. Is that is that the policy? I think you guys with this class warfare thing, rich, poor, like it's like- it's oh, like we're just trying is, to get your taxes oh, no, policy, dude. No, but, it, no, but <laughs> it's like, no, you're, you're yeah. not- Oh my God, he won't even- They're asking him the question. He's dodging. And then now they're, it's follow up, same question. He's like, bro, you, you're doing class, <laughs> class war and stuff. No, actually, Doug Burgum. There already is a class war, and it's being waged by the rich on everybody else. Remember that Rand Corporation study, which found that the top 1% effectively stole $50 trillion from the bottom 90%. You remember that? You remember that? Oh, you don't. You didn't see it, or you saw it, and you didn't care, or you saw it, and you thought, that's really based. I like that. God, he's so defensive. And he's defensive because he knows his positions are unpopular and he know he can't defend them. And she's like, I'm just trying to figure out where you are on these issues. Just say it. You guys with this class warfare thing, rich, poor, like it's like it's oh, like we're just this trying is, to get your taxes. No, 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 but, it, no, but it's like, no, you're, you're yeah. not. You're trying to you're trying to frame no, it in some no, kind of ideology no, about some people aren't paying enough. I'll say that. Oh, absolutely. It's it's factually accurate based on the numbers. It's empirically true. <laughs> you're trying to bring up like information and stuff that I don't need like this information. It hurts my fifis, so I gotta hide from it. I'm just trying to ask you a question because you're running for president and you're not answering the question. That's all we're trying to do. Well, I think I'm, so in, I'm answering the question. Code, I answered the question. Do you like it is, the way it is? Would you, you change it? Do you think it's too too hard on the rich to, you know, the top income bracket? If you don't want to call them the rich, just tell us what your tax policy would be. We don't, all the programs you guys are talking about are paid for with borrowed money. And that borrowed money comes from foreign countries <laughs> okay. that buy our bonds. And so we need capital to flow to the United States okay. for us to be competitive. And we want to have a regulatory and tax regime where capital flows to our country. That ensures prosperity so for lower everybody. Taxes. I think when you've got less regulation, lower taxes, then capital and talent flows in that direction and that grows the That's economy. Fair, and then guess enough. what? Then everybody has an opportunity to prosper. We're not in a stab. <laughs> By the way, that is factually not true. We saw what happened under Reaganomics. We saw what happened under George W. Bush. We saw what happened in the so-called Roaring Twenties, which led right into the Great Depression, the stock market crash in 1929. When you cut regulations, you cut red tape, you lower taxes for the wealthy, you have these giant boom bust cycles and you have tremendous income and wealth inequality and you explode the debt and the deficit. Okay, so none of that is accurate, but nonetheless, at least he kind of said it at the end, like yeah, low taxes even for the wealthy. I think when you've got less regulation, lower taxes, then capital and talent flows in that direction and that grows the That's economy. Fair. And then fair guess enough. what? Then everybody has an opportunity to prosper. We're not in a stab. Uh, we appreciate your time, sir. Thank you, we appreciate the back and forth. Thank you for yeah. spending some time with us. We appreciate you. Yeah. He goes on to try to clean it up here. 
He's like, and you know, the stuff about, uh, if you look at the policies of the innovation and the people uh, coming in to uh, get rid of the lines around the states, and people go and they do stuff and the economy is flourishing and the, if you do the the thing that <laughs> he just, he tries to clean it up because like, okay, it seemed like there was a moment there where he thought they were playing gotcha with him. Like you could tell he got his, he got defensive. But then at a certain point, it seems like he realized that the switch flipped and then he flipped it back. And he was like, oh no, they're asking in good faith and just trying to get my policy positions. And then since he had that realization, he's trying to go back and clean it up and be like, I'm, I'm cool, bro. I'm, I'm, I'll, I'll tell you what I think about stuff, man, even though I've been dodging saying my obvious positions, bro. So man, that was, whoo. This goes to show you what happens with these politicians under minimal scrutiny. Minimal scrutiny, basic policy questions, basic follow-ups. They're used to just BSing their way through everything. They're used to just, you know, giving fortune cookie slogans and platitudes and cliches and we're better when we stand together. It's like, that doesn't mean anything, bro. So anyway, Doug Burgum. Burgumentum is, uh, let's just say it, it, uh, it's going to slow down just a wee bit after this. Hey y'all, do me a favor and like and subscribe. It helps out big time in the algorithm. Click the bell as well for notifications when videos drop and watch that video on screen right now. You know you want to.